Daniela Murillo was born in San Jose, Costa Rica. She recently graduated from the BA in Art History at the Courtauld Institute of Art, London. Her relationship with art has been a long one, beginning with her grandmother's love for art and craft. A pivotal point for her was during the high school years when her, when her visual arts teacher strongly encouraged her not to exclusively focus on the European line of thought in her practice. Instead, to study Costa Rican art, its history and its artists. Among these artists was Adriana Arguedas. This stuck with her and she then understood that the Costa Rican artistic ecosystems, its parts, its deficiencies and its unlimited potential. Since then, she dedicated most of her university career to studying several Costa Rican artists, concluding her degree with the following dissertation. Unmasking Identities Through the Mascarada, a study of contemporary Costa Rican artist Adriana Guedes Ruano Los Cautivos. Daniela has also conducted a seminar on the history of Costa Rican art during her internship at the Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice. In curating the exhibition, This Must Be Paradise, Daniela has had the chance to study under-researched Costa Rican history and bring together the works of seven Costa Rican artists responding to questions of identity through genres from the tropical Gothic to the masquerade. Also joining me this evening is Adriana Guedas, a Costa Rican artist from the small town of Barva de Heredia, where he grew up watching his great uncle sculpt the clay bases for traditional paper masks. In 1990, he, grew, he, he received a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Costa Rica, followed by studying engraving practices at the Ecole Boda in Lorient, France, as well as a Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Miami, Florida. Winning the Aquiello Ecaraveria, Costa Rica's National Exhibition Award, a total of four times, Adrian's artwork explores themes of indigenous agency and the human condition in popular culture and the socio-political socio context of artistic creation in Costa Rica, often through reference to the traditional masquerades. And finally, founded by, in 2024 by Daniela, Puente, which means a bridge in Spanish, is a collective dedicated to establishing the first cultural exchange between Costa Rica and London of modern and contemporary art by Costa Rican artists. Often overshadowed by its neighbouring Latin American countries, the cultural and artistic landscape of Costa Rica has mirrored the position as a bridge between North and South America. A hybrid nation caught between two continents, the vision of the collective is to champion Costa Rican artists outside of Costa Rica and provide them with a platform to produce, present and engage with the European market in a way that has never truly been realised. And now we get to talk about all the lovely artwork. Um, so Daniela has asked me to start with this work by Arguedas, which features the head of a woman as a seed. The woman becomes the carrier of the world that is being created on top of her head. She feeds and nurtures the tree, symbolising ideas of growth. She provides the grounds for future generations to come and hints of ideas of reproduction, how humans are eternally created and also create eternally. Um, so Daniela, could you start by telling me a bit more about how artists in this exhibition have related to Costa Rican art history and the issues that these artists might have faced? First of all, thank you so much, Abigail, for that very kind introduction, and also Nicola for having us today. Um, we're very honored. Um, also, that's a very, very complex question. It's because we have uh, seven artists in the exhibition. So basically, uh, that means that there's seven different ways of experiencing and expressing uh, growing up in the same country, but also, you know, responding to a history and an identity. So here we have um, three works that are currently on display in This Must Be Paradise. So to the left, we have Aldean's work, uh, Semilla, Eda, um, Seed Eda. Then on the center, we have Sangre Nocturna by Cristian Wedel. And then to the right, we have Tierra Caliente, uh, um, three by Eric Biques. So we can see here um, from the very beginning how basically these artists all work with very different visual languages. Um, even though like they all have the same history, they come from the same past. It's quite a tricky question in that way because it's a history that's still being dismantled, right? It's something that we are still trying to decipher, we're still documenting and it's still being written to this day. So here we have like three different examples. So with Christian, we have this whole idea of bodies and plants and transformation and how there's like um, a transition, you know, space where he explores 
um, how we relate to plants and like how plants like are abstracted. And it's really interesting in that way, like speaking to an indigenous heritage that has always been really interested in like anthropomorphism. You know, that's been something like very common in Mesoamerican cultures. And you can even see it in some vases, you know, um, there's figures with humans and animals and plants. Um, and then with Eric, we have the tropical Gothic, which is completely another different uh, type of way to like relate to a history because he actually um, is really inspired by a movement uh, which is called tropical Gothic. There's a film experimenting like group that happened in the 70s and 80s called Grupo La Cali in Colombia. And they were trying to like express how there's like a landscape of horror where social relations appears appear to be condemned and doomed. So it's a really interesting like way of seeing like all of these different artists experimenting with like different histories from like local and a bit more um, global perspectives. And then we have Aldian's work. I think he is the best one here to talk about it because he's the creator. But I think it's also really interesting how it's a seed, you know. So we have plants and there's always a relationship with nature. Um, all of these artists unconsciously or consciously have related with nature too, which is something that, you know, it's in the history of our country, but it's also like an immediate reaction to it um and i don't know what alian if you have to say anything about that hi how are you <laughs> uh, thank you and nicola and thank you Abigail, for having us here uh, well i have to say we, we are related with nature our countries all the whole countries is nature What, what I mean by this is that somos un espacio donde la naturaleza es muy fuerte. Mm -hmm. Somos un lugar eh, que se expresa a través de la naturaleza. We express ourselves uh, through nature. So if you see the art history of our country, you 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 might see an important way to see it in that sense. So we have like a, a big amount of art related with nature, landscapes, uh, abstract paintings, but with, which has influence by landscapes, for example. And we have uh, uh, in, the cam in the academy and the modern times, this uh, topic in my uh, work you can see something else that is related with the conquest with uh, today history and and the pre-columbian time so yeah yes because it's it's really interesting in that way because like As you were saying, nature is a very powerful thing and it's very powerful to us and it has always been. And it's, it's also very well respected in, in our culture in, and in our history because your work really tackles so many different types of, you know, histories that exist in Costa Rica, which makes our identity itself really, really complex because there's so many paths to it, like even the masquerade, which we will go on to talk about Um Sí, yo, yo tal vez, Daniela, lo voy a decir en español porque sí, sí, sí. Eh, lo, lo necesito. Eh, el, yes, I, digamos, yeah. hay, hay, un, hay una gran, eh, no solo hay una gran eh, referencia hacia, hacia la naturaleza, eh, también yo creo que hay una característica también, es, hay una pro, se problematiza el, el tema, es, es una naturaleza que a veces nos toma, es una naturaleza conflictiva y creo que eso va a estar en, en la obra artística de muchos artistas, creo que en ellos particularmente, en Christian y en Eric, está ese elemento ¿verdad? Yeah. Yeah, Entonces, sí. yeah, he's mentioning how there's like this really big part of like nature being also a conflict and that it's present in like these three artworks y pro, 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 ¿sabes que Probablemente tal vez también mucho del título de tu exposición tiene ese 
ese doble sentido, o sea, yo creo que precisamente es ahí donde estás punzando. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's an there's like a certain irony to the name of the exhibition of paradise, and there's like always been an association with nature too. Um, even if that's a Catholic association, or because we also um like when the Spanish came, we we had that like very Catholic, and we still do have that very like strong Catholic influence. Um, but I feel that someone that really summarizes well. the issues that we face um, is Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, which is this quote here. So he gave the the speech, the speech called The Solitude of Latin America, and he won the Nobel Prize for, for literature. And this is a segment of it. And he says, the mental talents of this side of the world in an ecstasy of contemplation of their own cultures have found themselves without a proper means to interpret us. One realizes this when they insist on measuring us with the same yardstick with which they measure themselves without realizing that the ravages of life are not the same for all, that the search for one's own identity is as arduous and bloody for us as it was for them. To interpret our reality through schemas which are alien to us only has the effect of making us even more unknown, ever less free, even more solitary, which I feel like it's very, very pertinent with our art history and the way we relate to art practices as well. Yeah, I mean, it's something that we are, you know, constantly questioning and it's still being documented as well. So I don't know if you agree with that, um, Don Adrian. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. We have a conflict, but, but I think it's the human nature too. Yes. So I don't see any problem with that. Mm -hmm. We have to face it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. yeah, I think you said, especially when we've spoken a bit before about how, when you, when you talk about this yardstick, because which yardstick do you use for a country that is by the nature of its history, so many different cultures enmeshed. Even geographically, you know, speaking, But yeah, exactly. Yeah. we've always been like this bridge between North and South America, you know, like the Incans and the, and the Mayans and the Aztecs, like we have influences from all of those cultures too, because it was always like a passageway. Um, and to this day, it's also a passageway. So we've had like so many different types of merging of cultures and like conquests you know now there's people that debate that we're going through an american conquest so it's um a really interesting history in that way but it's also very complex and it's quite hard to frame things that's what's so interesting about the exhibition you've curated is that there are so many individual responses to it and different identities and art is a really nice way to address those ideas and express history and identity so for my question i want to ask adrian a little bit more um about the history of masquerades in relation to his works so am i right in thinking that the origins of the tradition are somewhat contested and various and How has this informed your relationship to contemporary artistic practices? Okay, but I'm gonna read a little bit something that I, I wrote before. So, the popular masquerade initially arises as part of the conquest of the American continent. It is an event that comes from Spain, an event, event speaks of a process of acculturation, submission, and death. In Latin American folklore or popular tra uh, tradition, participate a mixture of cultures. In this case, uh, the Costa Rica popular masquerade, aspects such as Black African culture, a, a product of slavery, the Spanish and the pre-Hispanic natives merge as a result what we, today we understand as popular culture. In Spain, the Middle Ages, for example, uh, has a uh, The popular masquerade was related with, with Catholic, or well, still in Costa Rica and Spain. And it's an event that is part of the religion, beginning uh, pagan. And there is a series of characters that inhabit the event of come from the historical moments, such as the giant or giants 
represent the king and in Costa Rica represent the Spanish. Death, the devil, which is um, the man or the old man of the bladder among others. Uh, we are proud of, of what Garcia Canclinis uh, says as a, a hybrid culture. The masquerade carry dichotomies, concepts that are expressed in my work. Today in my town, uh, the popular masquerade is one of the strongest uh, resistance event. This tradition persists uh, as a form and ritual union of celebration, life and death, expressed to the celebration of the saint. But uh, above all of this, pagan is something that like, is very strong. Every 24th of August, we celebrate with joy community, the most current living and bring together thousands of people in our streets. Well, in my case, the popular masquerade refers to my artistic project. I am very into the concept around mask. And I see as a nation, uh, as a, como un, uh, una forma anciana de cultural. O sea, más allá de, de, de nuestro país. Uh -huh. y, y creo que, digamos, hay tantos conceptos alrededor de la mascarada que yo puedo desarrollarlos de diferentes formas en diferentes momentos de mi trabajo. Por uh -huh. su, of course, my, my uncle, my great uncle, Carlos Salas and María Elena, is very import, important for me because... I grew up with them, so I see it. I see them as uh, probably the more important uh, persons in my life. In, and I decided to to study art because of them and because my mom. The relationship with them was so strong. I see them uh, work with uh, the costumes with the techniques, mass techniques, and that is very important for a community too, uh, because he was the first uh, artisan in my town. So I've been developing a lot of uh, this idea of using masks, uh, subjects, and I use, for example, too, like ideas that come from, uh, for example, uh, Carl Gustav Jung, uh, about the person as a mask, as a social mask. And I mix all these contents with other literature or influences that come from Europe, but here from the um, ancient people who live here in our land. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I, I could explain myself. I, I'm not sure. No, I think that's that's wonderful. I think it's and it leads really well into the next slide we've got, which shows another of your works alongside this old piece from the Spanish. But just to continue what you were saying about, I think it, it's so interesting that you have this this meshing of two traditions, the indigenous one and also medieval Catholic masquerades. And it comes together in this sort of it's 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 Catholic, but it's also a form of like indigenous resistance. And I think that's and yeah, it, it continues. Is. It's it's really really interesting yeah yeah i see i see the the popular mask as a micro world mm -hmm. i i see it there is a reflection of our mm -hmm. our situation so i see the human being reflect reflecting the whole event of course there is a lot of research about it i use all those contents mm -hmm. uh, but but you can see how people even though they Sometimes they don't know exactly what is going on with the popular mass. They're celebrating, but, but you can see uh, the ritual that is behind. You can see how it relates with other periods of times and with other cultures. So mm -hmm. in that sense, I, I think people from some, somewhere else can understand this, this work, even though it's very like specific from my 
people in our, our country and my town because every event in each town has differences. For example, in my town is very violent. The event is very like uh, the people who wear the mask wear to a blend a cow blender and they hit the other ones and smell pretty strong and music, liquor, uh, like sometimes even drugs you can see in the event. But but you can see how people enjoy and have a good time. And that relates with, uh, for example, with the um, Saturnal parties in Rome, you can see how that becomes every like changing in different moments, but it, it keeps like the essence of human union and and y compartir, compartir sobre todo la fiesta. Mm -hmm. Sharing, sharing, and it's basically a community, you know, that's like, you always mention that the human condition is such a big part of, of your practice and tradition mm -hmm. is such a big part of it as well. When I went to your exhibition um, mm -hmm. in the Museum of Costa Rican Art back home, so this work that we have here, uh, the window was part of the display. It was really, I think, important for, for us as Costa Ricans to see this because it's such a big tradition that we is often sometimes in the background you know or it's just like background noise and I feel like we need we need this and we need your art as well for us to like understand okay. ourselves okay. better and okay. that's why I proceeded to do my dissertation on it because <laughs> you learn so much through Adrian's work about our history and how complex it is like you think it's just you know the popular masquerade but then we have the masquerades that indigenous cultures have to this day, for example, the borucas, right? So they have yeah. El Juego de los Diablitos, which El means like, the little devil's game. It's kind of like a celebration of indigenous resistance. And you can see like, there's so many different types of history. So like when you, it's almost like Don Aldian with, with his work, he plants a seed and then <laughs> things start growing and you, you don't like, you start understanding so many things and you start questioning, you know, like our, I mean, our identity. Yeah, but we have to say too that I come from a tradition, a very important tradition of uh, art that mm -hmm. started like, well, you can put it in the 30th with a group, uh, La Generación Nacionalista, with Francisco mm -hmm. Aguetti, uh, uh, Kiko Quiroz, um, Max Jiménez, uh -huh. hay una, una serie de artistas que pensaron el país desde adentro, que uh -huh. cambiaron un poco la, el, el momento de la academia y empezaron a ver de adentro hacia afuera. Y eso es, digamos, yo me debo a ellos. Uh -huh. eh, entonces es muy importante, digamos, pla, eh, plantear que hay momentos importantísimos en Costa Rica uh -huh. para que yo esté aquí con, con usted y que usted me haya llevado a Inglaterra. <laughs> oh, that is so sweet so he was just saying that he's been really influenced by artists artists from the 30s such as Francisco Miguetti and Max Jimenez which they both did engravings as well and, and prints yeah. so he's saying that they studied our identity and our history from the inside to the outside and that there's like a whole lineage of graphic prints that started in the 30s so again quite a recent history so i want to ask you a bit about current academic research practices of art history in costa rica and after spending your three years at the courthold looking into it i'm sure you have a lot of insight so what have you kind of found are like some of the main differences between art history in an, a european institutional setting like the courthold and in costa rica um, and I'm thinking back to that speech by Garcia Marquez you mentioned, which discusses this contested idea of the arts and cultural history in South America. Yes, of course. I mean, the whole idea of the yardsticks, I think, is the best way to describe it. Because, I mean, with the research that I've been, that I did for my dissertation, for example, I, I came to the conclusion that our history, you know, lies in people's basements. So I also contacted this group um, of curators back home. They did this incredible exhibition called Cronologías de lo, in de lo Invisible a couple of years back. 
And so it's chronologies of the invisible. So it was this exhibition held in the Jade Museum back home. And it was of only women artists. And they were telling me how basically they had to knock on doors and ask people like, can I please see this? Because there's you know, we don't have a lot of archives. We don't have a lot of documentation. Like, also, we've lost a lot of documentation. There is like a period in time that we don't know a lot about because things were, you know, erased or destroyed, you know, to try and and bring forward another history after the conquest. So it's really different. And by growing up, I didn't have any, any art history, the arts, there's not a lot of education in that sense. Like if you want to pursue it, you pursue it after like university. It's been like really, really difficult if you actually want to do a research paper on something. But for example, in the masquerades, there are there is research and there has been research about it. And Don Adrian helped me a lot with that. Like he recommended me some people. We were talking about Giselle Chang. She's someone that's a leader in like the research of masquerades. That is the masquerade as a practice. So I remember during my dissertation, they were telling me, like, is it art or is is like the engraving, the artwork? And there's so many layers to it, you know, which is like complicated. It's again, there's a lot of framing that happens in art history because of like the nature of the practice or the field itself that we know. And we've we're trying to move away from that. We're building a chronology now. We're trying to build a chronology today. Hay historia del arte en el país. Es una historia, es una historia que se ha escrito de manera fragmentada. Hay un ejercicio, hay un ejercicio que está haciendo Efraín que es compilar diferentes momentos para entender esa cronología, que es un poco lo que estás planteando. Y, y uno puede, digamos, en la búsqueda de entender la historia del arte del país, eh, tiene que leer, digamos, momentos históricos que no es necesariamente están unidos en su totalidad, ¿verdad? Pero existe, digamos, existe la información. En el caso del grabado, por ejemplo, a, a principios de los 2000, eh, por una necesidad en el contexto de la universidad, eh, Fran Hernández y yo hicimos el, el libro que se llama Tinta y Papel, que es un libro que habla de la historia del grabado del país desde 1900, que es una aproximación, pero que yo básicamente surgió por una necesidad en el, en el contexto de las clases de grabado de hablar de la historia del grabado, que no había sido historiada. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Exactamente. Like what, what Adrián is saying is that there's, there, there is a history of art that is very fragmented, and to be ordered to like understand it, you have to bring all the pieces together, which is like what F. Hernandez is what he's trying to do, and Don Adrian as well. So they had a book called Ink and Paper. So it's the you know the history of printmaking in in printmaking. Costa Rica. So yeah. there's like so many different fragments. You know we're trying to bring it together. It's interesting and like exciting, but obviously a very different way of approaching it than going to the National Archives in Kew that we do for looking at British art. And it leads me really nicely into my next question to Adrian. Um, so you work with a lot of different mediums. You've got a very impressive set of skills and you also studied engraving in France. Yeah. So could you tell us a bit about how your artistic practice continues to sort of explore these historical European techniques like engraving and woodblock prints, but also imbuing them with a sense of like contemporary Costa Rican indigenous identity and of course how this like kind of relates to the history of printmaking specifically in Costa Rica which I'm sure you could talk for hours on having written a book on it but in a slightly <laughs> well, shorter gonna, version. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna do a part in English and another one in Spanish. Okay. I, I have to say about the techniques about the materials and uh, that I had a necessity to explore as a part of a process I, I don't see I don't see myself as, as a specialist. Uh, I, I I don't I mean I, I don't want to be a painter or a printmaker. I I need to talk about contents. Uh, I need to communicate ideas, and I try to use uh, those materials as a part of, of an idea. So that's why I've been doing like installation, video, 
pre-make in, in, in France. For example, I study like, like etching, basically. I didn't do like woodcuts or stuff like this. And in Miami, I, I made like a mixture between drawing and, and pre-making using the, the floor of our building, old building. Yeah. And about the, how I relate with uh, my work with ancient culture, I, I sí tengo que hablarlo en español. <laughs> <laughs> y lo que tengo que decir es que eh, hay una exhibición que hice hace al, alrededor de 10 años que se llamaba eh, El Aprendiz. Y en esa exhibición, básicamente, lo que hice fue acercarme todavía, bueno, tiene que ver con la mascarada, porque conforme uno estudia los temas alrededor de la mascarada, lo que ve es una, una línea continua de lo prehispánico con la mascarada. Entonces, en, en la exhibición El Aprendiz, y que la semilla es parte de esa exhibición, eh, básicamente lo que hice fue hablar de tres momentos históricos eh, relacionados con las culturas prehispánicas, relacionados con el momento de la conquista y relacionados con, con, con la actualidad. No sé si quieres decir, eh, tra traducir un poquito eso, Daniela, después continúo. Mm -hmm. The series from, which is called El Aprendiz, so The Apprentice, and Seed Eira, the, the print that we saw, that was from that series and he was talking about having like three different what, what were moments. Like, moments. like three different moments in history and so it was ritual and it was, was no what pre, else? Pre, uh, like like natives uh pre-hispanic natives i mm -hmm. studied that like their cultures the their process mm -hmm. we have a like a big uh, amount of, of pieces that from that moment that you can study and of course there is a lot of eh, hay muchas culturas que están vivas sin embargo yo estudié más aquel aqu aquellos documentos que son más antropológicos verdad o sea no 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 me centré tanto en las culturas que aún siguen pues que est están aquí los bribris los borucas verdad entonces uh -huh. es importante también decirlo no uh -huh. because I I remember in the there, there's a catalog for that um, series. Yeah. And yeah. I remember there was a thing that said that all the prints that you had were also kind of a direct response to the images that were going around in the Americas during the counter-reformation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I, I, <laughs> so I remember <laughs> seeing that and I thought it was like really interesting. Um, to... Sí, hay una, hay, también hay la idea del aprendiz es... es destapar desde, por ejemplo, desde mi punto de vista, eh, cómo a nivel cultural hay, hemos, digamos, hay historias invisibilizadas. De esto ya hablaste un poco. Uh -huh. hay, hay cosas que no se dicen. Hay, hay un sentido de pertenencia que a veces está eh, invisibilizado o cortado. Y uh -huh. cómo, digamos, eh, cronológicamente, Puede contarse una historia desde un objeto que comparte esos tres momentos, ¿verdad? Esa es, es era un poco la intención, también la idea de quiénes somos en el fondo. ¿no? Esa era lo que pretendía yo. Because he's saying that um, basically there's always this question of who, who we are, like who are we, um, where we come from, but he was, like Don Adrián was also saying, like, there's a lot of histories and a lot of invisible histories and how he tries to like bring all these histories together in his work. And there's like three, you know, like so many different ways. To, yeah, do know. it like trying to do like an object that has those moments and sometimes it's in conflict, the relationship with them, or sometimes it's kind of tough to, uh, tough to talk about it because, well, the conquest, was an interesting moment for us. And I think in different moments, uh, we have new conquest. Mm -hmm. uh, o sea, en, en los, la cultura americana es avasallante en, en nuestros países. Y en ese yeah. sentido, digamos, yo he, he querido explorar también, también. El, el sentido de, de, 
de transculturación o aculturación que sigue siendo parte del proceso. Hay, de alguna forma hay una, una devolución, por lo menos a nivel eh, simbólico, de, de lo que se ha, se ha digamos, eh, en esos procesos de muerte o de aculturación, hay una devolución porque mucha cosa fue llevada y, y estas imágenes cierran un poco ese círculo de, bueno, intentando decir, aquí está esto, seguimos vivos, seguimos produciendo, tenemos una forma de vernos y, a, y de amarnos y de agruparnos. Y la mascarada yo creo que es una forma bastante interesante de hablar de, de eso, ¿no? I, yes, I mean, everything that he said is really spot on because he was saying that there's a lot of history and a lot of objects that were taken from us. You know, it was kind of robbed, but the masquerade is a symbol of, look, we're still here and we still have things that, that bring us together. And we are still like happy people that have like a really big community and that we celebrate with art as well. Um, and... Yeah, like I think you can really like see that in in your work, most definitely. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, if I go to one final quick question, and then we'll open up to questions from everybody. Um, so, Daniela, having this exhibition in the heart of London is really exciting because um, I think we've said it's the first um, Costa Rican artists to have been exhibited and had solo shows in London, but there's never been an exhibition of. Um, a whole group of Costa Rican artists together in London. Um, so what do you hope the audiences will be able to take away from this exhibition um, at the end of it? Um, basically, I, I mean, for all of us, we just really hope that you can celebrate because this is basically a celebration um, of our culture and our history and our art and the artists because like there is so many tales of friendships between the artists too that are exhibiting and this sense of community and helping um so we really hope that we can channel that in in this exhibition and hope to you know show a little bit a little piece of our you know paradise on earth as as a lot of people call it um and yeah Yes, I you know like there's so many things that we just want to share to the world and let you know let you know that there's a lot of potential and there's you know so it, like it's there's a lot of passion to it too um we're very hard workers and we can you can see that in our art as well so I really hope you can take that you know with you and I don't know if Don Adrian agrees as well Yeah, of course, and and I think it shows a, a view of who we are and we were uh, and what we are doing. I think it's like a un, un pequeño abrebocas. O sea, creo que es una manera de acercarse al país a través del arte. Y, y bueno, agradecido con Abigail y con eh, vos, Daniela, de verdad, y con uh, eh, por darnos la oportunidad de estar acá. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nadian. Thank you very much. He's thanking as well all of you for for being here and for letting us share this with you um, because it's it's really special and very, very personal to all of us. So thank you, Abigail. Thank you, Nicola, as well. So I, really, I wanted, first of all, I mean, thank you so much. That was just wonderful. Um, so interesting. Really, really interesting. And um, I am... Um, I, I think what we in Western countries like the UK and North America can, I think we really have to learn a lot from the art of other countries around the world, particularly um, in the global South, about nature and about how we think about nature and our relationship with it and our relationship with, with the past our symbolic relationship with the past, you know, through mythologies, through, because I think we've, we've, we've become so, I don't know, we've got inside our heads to such a point that everything is so abstract now, everything is so um, over conceptualized that we forget that we're human beings and that we have to interact with the planet and with each other and our emotions. 
Um, and I really feel that that's a problem in a lot of the art that's produced um, here. Um, but I was, so I was very interested in what you talked about, you know, that everything is nature in, in Costa Rica and about the emphasis on nature in, in the exhibition. And I, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. But I also wanted to ask you, uh, um, I mean, there were other, other questions, obviously, but um, perhaps the question I want to ask you most is about the mask because that's really fascinating. I mean, masks have been have been so used in so many different cultures. I mean, from European cultures to African mm -hmm. cultures to Japanese, you know, it just seems to be something, as I think you both said, which is prevalent everywhere and has been throughout history. Um, and you know, how it, it kind of, I suppose they, they function, if you need to look at it, in a general sense, as a as a as a sort of mechanism for catharsis, a mechanism for both bringing the community together and expelling any mm -hmm. fears and negativities and uncertainties, and you know, I, I I got that impression from what you were saying, Adrian, about how it works in I your village. I was trying to say, <laughs> yeah, bueno, lo voy a decir en español. El el creo que la máscara es una de las formas más efectivas de, de romper eh, la cotidianidad o los procesos, digamos, de, de opresión eh, a través del ritual. Eh, creo que la máscara, si uno la observa, como, como decías, Nicola, a, a través de la historia, ha cumplido una, una función de protección pero también de catarsis, como decís, también de, de, de pasar de un estado al otro, de, de vida hacia la muerte. Ta también me parece que la parte más interesante también es cómo, eh, cómo nos relacionamos con ella en el sentido de la sombra que plantea yo, eh, Carl Gustav Jung. Es decir, al, hay una desinhibición y ahí además hay, un des, hay una desaparición de uno cuando uno porta la máscara. Y creo que eso, bueno, yo lo estoy explorando todavía. Creo que en, el, en la exhibición de Valle Oscuro hay, había un, un guiño eh, a través del performance con máscaras. Yo hice, construí personajes, los bailamos el primer día. Pero, digamos, tiene un potencial sanador. Yo creo que por eso también es tan importante por ejemplo, para mi comunidad, eh, expresar la alegría y la unión del pueblo y, la desini y desinhibirse y desaparecer como individuo. Ese sí. es otro elemento que es fundamental. O sea, somos, somos eh, en, en una colectividad y nos necesitamos unos a otros, pero obviamente hay fuerzas externas que podemos identificarlos como la globalización, como los gobiernos, que lo que pretenden es sembrar miedo. Y creo que en el momento en que, por ejemplo, un evento como la mascarada popular existe, nos sentimos seguros, nos sentimos parte de algo. Y, y creo que eso, eso es tal vez lo, de las cosas más importantes que, que comunidad, como comunidad tenemos hoy. Y que tiene que ver con la historia de la humanidad, sí. para mí. Daniela, do you want to translate a bit? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, so, I think the, 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 the subtitles, when Adrián speaks Spanish, work really well. It's when he speaks English that they hallucinate completely, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> but when you speak Spanish, so hopefully people have been able to understand your English, and which is perfect. Um, but they, they can also understand your Spanish through the subtitles. But I think to be on the safe side, maybe Daniela, summarize what, what Adrian's just said. So, I mean, I think it's really interesting that he says that the masks are a healing mechanism, a mechanism of catharsis, but also um, of protection. Uh, that's what like he was telling us at the very beginning, but also the fact that for many, like a lot of cultures now are trying to just, you know, um, there's a lot of like fear, like even in, in media, you know, media, social media culture, like everything is about fear. But in the masquerade, there's fear, but there's also a sense of community. So when you are 
when you wear a mask and you're performing like this ritual, you feel like you belong somewhere. And that's something that we need today. The sense of belonging, the sense of, of community. Um, so I, I do think that it's really interesting also that, as you were saying, like masks and masking and um, the idea of hiding, but also showing at the same time. Yeah. I think that is so relevant in cultures around the world, cultures that have never even engaged like it's such it's such a thing of human condition you know like the mask is just it's basically that you know like why have as we as humans like why do we feel the need to hide or to be someone else you know to mm. have this persona um which i yeah, think is and, something, yeah. and, and in that sense to 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 face your dark areas or your your things that you don't want to face it, you face it when you are wearing a mask. Yeah. So, and you express that in the the event, the community event. So. Yeah, and I also love the idea that the mask, you, you stop being an individual and you start being a community because I think that's mm -hmm. something which we have lost so much in the West. You know, we've become so atomized you know, the emphasis over the last few centuries on the individual in Western culture has, I think, led us up a very dark alley, you know, and I, it, it frightens me in terms of the future. I hope your generation, Abigail's and Daniela's generation can really move forward, you know, and bring us back to some sort of community yes. and, and more human connection. But um, yeah, that was very, very interesting. Um, I have lots more questions, but let's see if anybody else would like to ask a question. Okay, if not, I'll ask another question. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I was I was really also very interested in, I mean, at the beginning, Daniela used the word, we're dismantling Costa Rican history. And I thought mm -hmm. that was a really interesting use of, of the word because I guess in a country that's you know that's had so many different types of as you said so many different kinds of colonization and you know the Spanish conquest uh, and and different cultural you know European ideas that, that sort of took over probably since the enlightenment and then uh, then more recently North American culture in the 20th century and probably very dominant now, I should think, um, you know, that, that you have to dismantle all this and try and get back to a sense of history which feels more authentic. And, you know, the idea that, that Adrian was talking about this uh, generación nacionalista from the 1930s, you know, people trying to build and the role of artists in that, in, in filling the gaps. I think you talked about that, Adrian, didn't you? That what art can do maybe it was Daniela, what art can do when you have this art, this history, which is so dispersed, so fragmented, is that sometimes artists like you can step in and fill the gaps and explain how things come together and, and link things together in a way that, you know, that's very, that, that's satisfying, you know, that, that gives us a more holistic picture of, of Costa Rican history that is, authentic and it feels right to Costa Rican. Well thank you Nicole. <laughs> I don't I don't feel like that. I feel that I belong to something bigger and something like a movement with a lot of people. I have to say that that we are like I belong to a, like the fourth generation of pre-making in our country and there is a lot a, a lot of people that that other artists that are trying to do in, in other ways like trying to write our story but of course there is a lot of a, a lot of uh art historians that are doing like a great job sometimes it's, we don't have possibilities to publish or sometimes it's tough for example at the university when we uh, made the research the pre-making research it become like eight years to publish our book. So it's, it's, it's very difficult, you know? Well, I country. encourage you, I encourage you to, to submit publications to Colnagi Studies Journal, which we edit for the Colnagi Foundation. We've just done a symposium on uh, vice-regal art, 
because you know we are particularly interested in pre twentieth century. But you know, if 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 what you're talking about relates in some way to art history, then you know, submit your 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 publications to us. We can publish them. Well, thank you. I'm gonna bring. I'm gonna send Daniela's uh, our book, and I I I know that if I'm gonna be very happy if you can see it and watch it and think about it. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a really interesting history, Nicola. Thank you. Thank that, you. Would, that would be of immense help to, to like, you know, also the future people that want to also study the history of Costa Rican art. So that would be of immense help. Yeah, it was a really lovely symposium. We had so many different um, papers from across um, the globe that were presented. So hopefully it'll yeah. be really good. Um, uh, if there are any final questions um feel free to pop them in the chat or just speak up whenever um yeah. no maybe i would just like to congratulate adrian and really uh daniela as well for all this immense project of bringing costa rican culture to london and um it's it's a very uh let's say noble or very uh good way of connecting through culture between different countries and uh well done and congratulations thank you antonio it's nice to see you same muchas <laughs> gracias felicidades gracias gracias antonio okay um thank you so much for joining us and giving us such a wonderful insight into so many different things and art forms um it was really lovely to talk to both of you and yes, i think if you think we're about done nicola shall i <laughs> yes well thank you very much from me as well i really really enjoyed that and um yeah i hope we can stay in touch and i'm looking forward to seeing the exhibition tomorrow yes you must go and see the exhibition tomorrow if you're in london yes it's, it's really lovely it's such a it's yeah and Daniela will probably be there and tell you even more about all of the artworks and all the wonderful stories behind them there it's such a lovely exhibition. Um, and it closes on Saturday, right? Yes. Yeah, badly. So yeah, you have to go tomorrow or Saturday. Mm -hmm.